Lights, camera, action. Welcome to Conversations with Charlie. Today, we have a very special guest, Michael Figgis. Uh, I believe at his home in London. Is that correct? Yes, I'm in King's Cross, central London. Um, <clears throat> the heart of lockdown. The heart of lockdown. Well, I'm in, I'm in uh, Brooklyn in Park Slope, another, another epicenter of lockdown. <laughs> so, um, I, your life, uh, to me, uh, al although we've known each other for quite a number of years, I, 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 I know much less about the way your, your, art, your artist career began, because you, you've been a, a, a musician, a photographer, uh, uh, a, a filmmaker, um, and, and, and not in that order. In other words, I mean, you know, mm. from my, you, you know, and, and your life starting out as a, uh, as a musician is a bit of a gaping hole for me in the story of my okay. case. And it was, a, and it was a ton of years. Um, so, and you were, you were born, uh, in, in Carlisle and, uh, and then, uh, uh, I, I, I did not realize that you lived, you lived in, in Ni Nairobi until you were eight. Yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. These are, I, I love these types of stories because they, they set a context and they give us a little bit of insight into the man. So, uh, what, 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 going way back, what, what, what took your family to Nairobi? Well, my, my parents, my father was Irish. Um, his parents were colonial Irish, English Irish. They went to Kenya at the turn of the century, I guess. My grandfather um, established what is still one of the largest legal practices, um, daily and figures in Nairobi. Um, was, uh, you know, kind of founded the Irish Society in Kenya. So my dad, coming from a kind of fairly wealthy middle-class family, the typical upbringing, he was sent when he was very small, like I think eight years old, he was sent back to England to go to a private school, um, to a prep school, where they call it, and then to a public school, which we call it because there's, could, could, could not be less public because they were very elitist. Um, so he basically was, you know, sent out of the of the family home when he was eight. Uh, was educated in, in England, and then uh, the war broke out, and then he became a pilot. And at the end of the Second World War, um, he'd married my mother during the war. She was also in the Air Force. Um, my mother, very different, comes from a working class family in the north of England. Very kind of like religious, proper. Uh, my father was much more like he was a jazz musician, DJ, drinker, uh, party guy, really. Um, so he was and, a you, know, uh, he, you were exposed to music at a, at growing up. Yeah, that's where it all comes from. So he was a jazz fan. I have his jazz collection over there. Um, <clears throat> I wanted, he wanted to be a pianist. He was obsessed with uh, Billie Holiday, Teddy Wilson. Uh, Louis Armstrong, these people, and so he taught me from a very early age how to listen to jazz. But he went; he wanted to get out of England. He went, so he took uh, my mum, my sister, and me to Nairobi uh, when I was, I think, less than one year old, um, and lived a good life there for you know the next seven years. And then we left pretty much under a cloud, in fact, under a blanket, because I think he owed a lot of money. And <clears throat> I then went live with my grandmother in the north of England, which was uh, the biggest culture shock I think I ever experienced in my life. So you were coming you were, from you went, to, you went to Newcastle at that point? Is that where you moved? Yeah, well, Carlisle and Newcastle are like 50 miles apart. So my, my grandparents lived in Carlisle. My dad then got a job as a journalist um, on a Newcastle uh, paper. So we moved to a project, basically, you would call it like a tiny house, by, by which time there were five kids. So seven of us in this very small house. He got a job as a journalist and um, had his record collection. And, uh, you know, so then I, I grew up there, went to school there um, and started playing in bands when I was about 15, you know, because I was a, as a trumpet player and um, soul music was just coming in. So people, people wanted a brass section. So I ended up playing with um, a local band and then I joined a kind of very interesting band called um, uh, The Gas Board, which was which became Roxy Music, basically. 
So Brian Ferry was the singer. John Porter, who is now kind of established, well-known uh, producer, record producer, was the guitarist. <clears throat> um, and yeah, so, uh, and then I went uh, to London. I moved to London when I was 18 and studied, I studied music for three years because um, I wanted to learn more about the kind of formal aspect of composition. And I hadn't really trained. I mean, I was a good improviser, but I couldn't, um, I couldn't, for example, I couldn't really read music. I blagged my way into um, music college by pretending that I could read music, um, which had very funny but slightly disastrous consequences. But it, I, I did. It got me to London. I, I did really study hard for three years to understand basic composition. But probably more importantly, I started, I was in London at, at a seminal period in uh, in the sort of cultural post-war history. So uh, I started to meet very, very interesting avant-garde musicians and um, performance artists and filmmakers and so on. Um, looking back, I mean, I took that for granted. I thought that's what the world was like. And I, I realized that was a unique, very short, unique period of maybe eight or nine years maximum, you know, where London was literally on fire, was cooking. Um, and uh, I came in on the on the young end of that because most of the people I looked up to were a bit older, um, um, and that just got me. And I basically have had my base in London ever since then. But um, you know, obviously, as the next bit, as I you know, I started touring and I spent a large part of my life on the road, basically with in various guises as a musician or actor, performance artist or and then ultimately as a filmmaker, yeah. So that part of your life was, for argument's sake, that was like a like a 20 year stretch of, mu of music until Stormy Monday was 90, uh, 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 well, uh, 88, right? Maybe, so 60 yeah. to 88 around those amount of years or? Yeah, not, not entirely because what actually happened was when I came out of music college, um, I, um, began teaching music, you know, I was a qualified music teacher and looking for work. Um, and then what happened was uh, my friend John Porter called me up from France and saying he was in a band and I should come up and maybe join this band. They were starting this new group. Um, so I went out there for like three or four months. And um, meanwhile, I had started to play with an avant-garde free music ensemble called The People Band. Uh, really free jazz musicians, you know, wild, wild characters. In fact, I'm just making a documentary about one of the main guys now. And I, um, through them, started to see a lot of um, experimental theater and um, performance art. I became really fascinated by that, initially as a musician, because I was uh, just fascinated by how you could start to use music as a kind of very powerful psychological tool. Um, and then it was a kind of a bit of a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland moment because we were working very closely with this performance art group. And in a classic traditional way, the musicians and the actors, the performers started to fight and started that they, they fell out really badly because the musicians were making too much noise. So the performers couldn't hear themselves talking and ended up with a huge fight, <clears throat> literally in a performance venue after the gig. And it was quite violent. Things were thrown and uh, um, harsh words were exchanged. And I found myself more sympathetic in a way to the performers than to the musicians, because I thought, you know, they've got a point. They've got to be heard. Um, and everybody should back off at certain points and be respectful of each other's space. But, you know, these were avant-garde musicians, so they were not about to, as it were, back a bunch of performers. They didn't see themselves as the backing. <laughs> They saw themselves as equal and also being anarchists, they were like, you know, uh, we play when we want to play. We don't shut, we don't have cues and we're certainly not performing dogs. So we're not going to kind of like, we're not going to behave in that respect. So I, um, I thought about it quite quickly and I ended up joining the performance group as, as their chief musician. And then very shortly after that, they had a fight and a bunch of the actors left. And we had a very important gig. Um, and uh, I was basically told by Mark Long, the main, the main performer, I said, like, Mike, you're on stage, you know, 
uh, we need someone to actually perform. And there was a kind of seminal moment. I found myself on stage at a, at a very important theater called the Royal Court Theater in a, an amazing festival. It's called the Come Together Festival. And people look back on that festival as being a turning point in British performance. And in the audience was Mick Jagger and all, all these kind of like A-list kind of, uh, the, all the cool people. And I was on stage and I was having to riff verbally with this guy and, and improvise and, and uh, I, I decided I really liked it. I mean, I love playing music. I was playing music on stage as well, but I liked this acting, this performance. So I became a performer. Um, I carried on doing the music as like, you know, writing the music and creating sound designs for this performance group. Uh, and so for 10 years, I went on the road with them. And then we had a fight. Uh, and then I left and I formed my own performance company and that was in a way the crossover because there I started to use 16 millimeter film as part of the live performance, uh, incorporating live performance, same actors on film that were on stage, interacting with each other, composing the music. Uh, so we're still acting, performing, but starting to take more of a, a, a step backwards, um, I suppose what we would ultimately call directing. And writing. You were and you were with with the sixteen. You were doing some type of rear projection or side projection. Yeah, yeah. During the performance, I was back projecting. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm going to play director right now myself and ask you to tilt your camera up a little bit because I want to see yeah, yeah. your. I, I see the top I, of my head. I, I want to see the top of your head. I, I, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm playing. Uh, there we yeah. go. And then you in oh, the yeah. of the frame and looking at me and. Gazing the piano at, in the background. Gaze, and I love the piano in the background. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I got the, I got my, yeah. my signed movie posters hanging on the wall. I see that. Yeah, Black <laughs> Swan. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, I feel like after 25 years of having dedicated my life to working at Technicolor, uh, I'm afraid I became a, 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 a movie poster store. Yeah, yeah it's, sure. it's, uh, it's out of control, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, fascinating. So, all right, this is going on, and 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 the opportunity to uh, uh, to go from all of that activity to the making of a film that, for me, is a, a, a turning point film, and it was your first project right stormy monday um my first feature yeah your first feature film yeah hmm. how did how did that opportunity come about with all of this other stuff that you were doing that's a because you went from from what you were doing to a a a, a film that was going to be seen by a a, a a a global audience well you know uh The role of coincidence in, in anybody's life is, uh, you know, is, it was fascinating, you know, and as a writer, I always kind of go, hmm, coincidence, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's a topic, you know, that I will endlessly explore. Um, and I always think of all the, you know, for every coincidence that turned out well, think of the ones where you, you didn't even realize the guy was behind you on the bus and you never spotted each other, you know, so how many times did that happen, you know? So... When I said I had a fight with the, the People Show, it's the group I was on tour with for 10 years. You know, it's just like a rock band. I mean, you know, there were four or five of us. We were literally intensely, you know, in each other's faces for 10 years. So inevitably, there would be these uh, moments, you know, where you grow apart a little bit. And, and you start, in a way, wanting slightly different results of the work. And I was very in, always interested in the experimental aspect of, whatever you're doing. I was always interested in pushing that boundary because coupled with a real, uh, you know, fascination about technology. So like, you know, I remember, you know, when I got my first 16 millimeter camera, it was like, uh, I think it was a, it was an Arri ST, you know, the, the Barry speed post-war camera 16, standard 16. I bought it for, I don't know, not very much money. And then I went, a week later to New York with carrying all the equipment, no assistant. I'd never shot anything on 16 mil before, but I was kind of, and there's no internet, but I had a little instruction book. I'd bought a changing bag and I just practiced and practiced changing the magazines and all of that. 
and I went to you know New York, kind of ballsy, shot a whole bunch of stuff on this uh, on this camera I'd never even uh, used before, um, with the kind of blind faith that everything would come out at the lab. You know, I mean, I, was, I had a meter, and I'd been shooting still, so I understood the basics about exposure and all of that. But it was pretty a uh, pretty rash thing to do. What I should say is before this, what got me to this point of like, wanting to make films was, I became interested in films. I had a Super 8 camera, photographing my, my kids and things. And I decided when I had this big fight, I thought, you know what, good time to take a hiatus. So I applied to the National Film School um, and decide, I'd made a decision, I was gonna take three years out and study, just study filmmaking. Um, after all, I'd been on the road for 10 years. I'd, so I'd studied music, I'd studied stagecraft, I'd been an actor. I kind of knew what directing was because I was involved in the production of, of performance. Um, I was very good at sound because I already had a bunch of tape recorders, was making sound designs and recording things and making loops and all that shit, you know. So I never crossed my mind that there would be a problem. So I applied to the film school. <clears throat> I got a, um, an interview and on the panel was um, David Putnam, Sir Oswald Morris, Ozzy Morris, okay. uh, Romaine Hart, who had uh, uh, a cinema chain at the time. Um, and they were my panelists. And oh, I just, went in. Just, just David Putnam and Ozzy Morris alone. Oh my God, yeah. what a, what a, uh, that's a yeah. momentous uh, uh, a, a gathering of, uh, of of artists right there. Yeah. So I went in, and I was full of you know full of cheer, and uh, and you know, and I always enjoy meetings. So I was looking forward to it, and uh, and literally from the moment I stepped in, it it went wrong. And um, I think David Putnam said, you know, well, we looked at your application. You're coming from avant garde theatre. What makes you think there's any connection between what you've been doing and cinema? I was really taken aback and I said, well, it's, it's all the same thing. It's about performance, it's about communication and so on. And so forth. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Ozzy Morris, very cynical, uh, very, really did not warm to me and I very quickly did not warm to them. And it became, it became quite aggressive quite quickly. Pat, David Putnam asked me a trick question. He gave me a scenario and said, how would you deal with that? And I went, some disaster and I said oh I'd go and research it and uh, talk to people and then I would come up with a scenario and he said wrong answer and I said oh so what is the right answer he said I would hire a good script writer I know right okay if that's the approach you know got worse and worse <clears throat> and uh, they clearly they were not enthralled by me in the slightest so um, it came to an end and as I was leaving and kind of putting my things away, they said, uh, so what will you do if, you know, if you don't get into film school, what, you know, what, what are your plans? I said, I'll make a film anyway. And Ozzy Morris said, but you just told us you don't even know how to use a 16mm camera. And so my parting shot, which <laughs> looking back, it's like, I said, it can't be that difficult, you know. And I could yeah. see that was like, <laughs> if, if there'd been any doubt about me getting in, this, is, you know, I'd suddenly sealed my fate there which is a good thing. So in fact, what I did was I went out and made a film. I got a good camera woman, Diane Tamas, and um, I created a performance piece in which the center of it was a 40 minute film shot on 16. It was about my father, it was about the war. I was the actor in it as well as the director. And I just jumped in. Um, I drove everybody to the location, which was my mother's house in the middle of nowhere in the north of England. Um, I took the camera woman up with me and then on the first night she said, where's the shooting script? And I went, uh, I gave you the script. She went, no, that's a script. Where's the shooting script? Ah. And, I, and I said, well, well what's, that, what's that? She went, I need to know the shots and everything. So, so every night I would stay up to like two in the morning, do the shooting script, you know, you learn story, quickly. You were doing storyboards. Uh, uh, no, uh, or just, no, I mean, I was just, just the shot know. descriptions. Yeah, she just sort of said, you know, where is he? You know, where is the camera? What described the shot? Kind of. She told me. Got it. Before she went, she didn't sit with me. She went to bed. So every night I would 
you know, I was there for a week, I would, I would stay up after they went to bed. I would get up first, make everyone breakfast, make sure they're okay, placate my mother, who was not being the easiest woman in the world, having all these strangers in our house, making a film about her late husband, <laughs> performed by her son. It was, it was weird. And uh, anyway, shot the film um, and made this performance piece with the film as, as the center of it. Um, and then took that on the road. It was, it was very successful in those kind of avant-garde circles. And based on that, I did another two productions within which both of those other productions, film became the center. So I started to really kind of like hmm, learn about editing. I was cutting on a Steenbeck. Um, film sound, you know, so, you know. You, you, recorded, <clears throat> you recorded double system uh uh and 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 uh, or did you or were you shooting at all mos for the purpose of a project no we're shooting with it with an agra it was all the same you know, so, you were, so everything was just done from the from the get-go you were you were doing full-on double system shooting full on yeah and as soon as i got on a steam back i thought wow this is great you know there's the synchronization and you can you know i mean looking back it was like <laughs> there was there were two soundtracks you know it was your sync sound and then uh, one spare track for your for your music right but it was great and i already was very familiar with tape recorders and things like that so th that was not so complicated um and i just while wow, cutting the film and you know the whole the whole thing and the, sticking it back together was just wonderful so i just kind of for the next couple of years i just carried on you know i then bought a second hand art on uh, shot stuff for other people, you know, um, and I really got into the cinematography. Loved that. And then um, the big turning point came with uh, uh, Channel 4. Because remember, up until that point, there were like three TV stations. It was BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And so they announced there was going to be a new channel, Channel 4. And they were going to be commissioning new work. And this was like the, light, the only lifeboat, you know, in the ocean, really. Because you couldn't join a union, the ATS, ATST, whatever it was called, it was a nightmare. It was once Catch Twenty Two. You couldn't join the union unless you'd made a film, and well, you couldn't you make a film. You didn't have you didn't have IATSE in England, didn't you? The IA uh, TSE, uh, IATSE. Yeah. The yeah. So you had the same unions that we had in the U.S. Okay. Well, said we had our version of it. Yeah. The version and, of the internet. The ATST, AST, I think it was all the something. I can't remember. They were a nightmare. You know, they just said, no, forget it, you know. Um, and it was very kind of like nepotistic. So people came up in family groups and things like that. Depends who you knew, but you literally couldn't break in that way. Um, <clears throat> so Channel 4 comes along and there's a bunch of cool people on the commissioning editing board. And they're commissioning people like Neil Jordan, Stephen Frears. And I knew one of the editors. Um, so I, I, I went in, pitched a very avant-garde project, you know, um, and they sort of said, well, why don't you do something original? Do you have an original idea? And I went, yes, I do. And I did, I was something that was in my mind. And so I, uh, my first film shot on, on 16, not even Super 16, but it was shot by Roger Deakins, was a thing called The House with Stephen Ray and uh, you know, Nigel Hawthorne, most amazing that's, cast. So that's before Stormy Monday. Yeah, yeah, three years before. Three years prior to Stormy Monday, okay, all right. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it was a period fantasy set in 1880 in England, but at the opening credits, you saw England, or the map of England, and then you pull back and you see that England is not an island, it's landlocked. On one side, it's got Russia, to the north, it's got Latvia, it's got Prussia, and it's about to be invaded by Russia, you know? And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so it's all set in a country house with all these, these archetypical archbishop, general, house owner, blah, 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 and house guest Stephen Ray, who was a soldier, you know, talking about the impending invasion of the Russians because England had, a, had attacked Latvia and Russia was now going to counter invade. So it was this fantasy set in a landlocked, snowbound country house in the north of England. And so I made that film. Um, I, first of all, I did it as a performance piece. And, and kind of developed it that way using high, Super 8 film. And then with Roger, who I'd become friends with, he just left um, film school, the very film school I tried to get into. He'd done, um, 
his first films with, I think he'd done 1984 um, and with Michael Radford and Michael Radford's first 16 millimeter film. And so Roger was really just kind of finding his feet and was amazing. So he, I mean, it's the most beautifully shot film, this, this one hour film. I can only and of course, imagine. Yeah. Roger. So then of course the next, yeah. Yeah, the next thing is I get a, I get a, um, I was going to say an email, but we didn't have them. Then I get a, a letter from David Putnam saying, you know, oh, I just saw the, the old film and, but like we never met, right? Like, and it was like a moment in my life where I kind of go, am I, should I be diplomatic and say, actually, I don't, can I remind you that we did meet already? And I thought, no, what, Mike, if one wants to just keep your mouth shut and, uh, and play along. So we, we both made a decision not to acknowledge the fact that we have met before. He said, I love your, I love your film. It's like, blah, blah, blah. And I would like to commission another film. So I had this great meeting with him. Um, and he said, can you do a treatment? So it was originally called The Side. It was basically what became Stormy Monday. And I did a treatment and I sent it to him and I never, ever heard back. I went back to teaching. A year went by. Um, and then one day I was in Soho in the heart of the kind of commercial production company area in Soho, Wardour Street, little side street. And there was a massive dump, dumper, you know, what we call a skip outside a commercials uh, built, uh, venue, right? And it was full of um, audio tapes that had been thrown out and, uh, you know, kind of film stuff. Um, and I was teaching um, students at the time film, basic film stuff. Um, and they never had enough material. And I thought, wow, this is ridiculous, throwing away all this magnetic tape. So I backed my car up to the skip and I got in the skip and I started literally finding all the, the, you know, the reels that were, could be, because you could always reuse magnetic tape and started throwing them into the back of my, my uh, station wagon. And then I heard this voice, Mike, and I looked around, it was a guy called Nigel Stafford Clark, who had been the producer on my first film, The House. And uh, he sort of said, what, what are you doing? And I explained what I was doing. And then, then he said, well, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a bit stalled. I've got this movie idea, but um, I haven't heard back from Putnam and, uh, you know, as I'm just teaching. So he said, OK, well, this isn't the appropriate time, but if, why don't you come have a cup, cup of coffee? He at that time was working for the moving picture company, you know, um, who are still around. Um, and I went and had a cup of coffee with him and showed him the script. And he gave me some very strong notes and said, look, it's a typical first film. You're actually, there's three movies here. It's very complicated. If you'd like to choose the one, one of those movies, I'll help you get it made. And so um, I did, I, I took his advice, very good advice. I simplified the story into Stormy Monday. Um, and then we, you know, with his, guidance we had a script and then i guess another two years passed well while we had finance from um what was the company called you remember them um hemdale hemdale of course i remember yeah. hemdale okay. hemdale were responsible for a ton of films in that era yeah so it was just the point but they were doing really well they'd done platoon and things like that platoon. john daly uh, they announced at Cannes, they were, they were going to do Stormy Monday, which at that point was called Round Midnight. That's another story. Um, and uh, I just freeze frame on that for a second. I love the fact that two of the titles were named after music: Stormy Monday, BB King, Round Midnight. Yeah. Uh, 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 what is it, Charlie Parker? Yeah, I mean, fantastic. A felonious yeah. monk, actually. Yeah, yeah. Monk, I'm sorry, but yeah, I, 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 I yeah. Am, but but a, a classic jazz, uh, uh, and of course as we would know, but continue. I'm sorry. But I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the, the joke with Stormy and with Stormy Monday, it was, it's, it's the working title was round midnight. Now in the film at the end, the car blows up at midnight, you know, Sting is a bass player in a club, you know, so it was all about jazz, a jazz club in which a bomb goes off at midnight, round midnight. So we're putting on, and I get a phone call one and saying, that, um, I don't know how to tell you this, Mike, but uh, uh, there's a film just come out called Round Midnight, <laughs> directed by Tavernier, and it's about, you know, 
it's about a jazz musician. And so the title's gone. I'm sorry. I said, fuck, you know, so what are we going to do? You know, and then we went through this ridiculous thing with the company Atlantic releasing, who were then doing the movie and said, basically, you know, the ridiculous titles they come up with through their version of like a brain computer, um, you know, bad movie titles. So eventually, even though, you know, Stormy Monday really hasn't got anything to do, <laughs> to do with the film. You know, it's such a great song. And it gave us a title song and got, we got B.B. King to record it for us and everything, you know. So it, it sort of works, but the original title was literally on point, you know, with the plot, you know, so, but funny. That is funny. I didn't know that story at all. Yeah. But I, but I love the film. I mean, Sting playing the... Uh, the bass player and jazz club owner, right? And, oh my God. Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, he's from Newcastle too. Oh, he's originally from Newcastle as well, eh? Yeah, yeah. In fact, when we met, you know, when I first went to meet him in LA um, to talk about the movie, you know, he, you know, he'd obviously heard that I was, well, I arrived and he said, you know, I used to come and see your band with Brian Ferry. <laughs> I was still at school, you know, trying to make out he's so much younger than me. Sting said not. that to you. Oh my yeah. God. That's, that's a fantastic. Well, he did. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we were, the, we were the top band in, in Newcastle at that time. The coolest band and, you know, well, a cool bunch of guys, you know. And uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he used to come and, and see gigs. Um, and so, uh, that, you know, that would, we immediately got on and started talking about people we had we knew in common, saxophone players and things. And yeah, incredible, neat. And then yeah. and and so that film came out in in ninety eight, and then eighty eight. Right it was eighty eight. Ten years. Eighty eight. Yeah. Ten years off. Eighty eight. And then right behind it in nineteen ninety, you you made Internal Affairs. Yeah. And so there was a. You know, not much of a gap between the 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 two, but that but Internal Affairs was a, a studio film, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, much as I could talk with great eloquence about what is wrong with Hollywood, there's also a lot, in a sense, to be I, I can be very positive about. And one of the things is that I really struggled in the UK to get anywhere. You know, uh, and the UK has this tradition of not really supporting its own artists very well. So uh, both in the performance art world, we ended up spending most of our time in Europe, not, not in England. And then as a filmmaker, you know, when Stormy Monday came out, I got such negative press, you know, and negative reviews um, saying that what a, you know, kind of crass calling card this was. Mike just wants to go to Hollywood. He's using Tommy Lee Jones, Melanie Griffiths, you know, trying to make an American movie. It just really total put downs. Um, but it did really well in New York, Los Angeles, the you know, main urban centers. Got a great review in the New York Times, Janet Maslin, great review in the LA Times, and became a kind of little cult movie. Absolutely. And even, and even before it came out, you know, um, you know, I got a call from an agency from the, the Morris office, you know, uh, from Mike Simpson saying, you know, uh, I'd love to meet you. I hear, I hear, I hear promising things. And he actually flew over, um, came up to Newcastle and met me. It's like he, guy based in LA came up all the way to meet me and say hello. And I was just like, that would never happen in the UK, not in a million years, you know, and he signed me up. And so straight away, uh, you know, I started to have this connection. And when the film went to Cannes, um, you know, Clint Eastwood loved it and he invited me to lunch and offered me a movie, which I turned down, which I don't think he has ever forgiven me. Um, but it kind of suddenly I had, loves jazz. So, I mean, you guys, yeah. were, you guys were being no, we had the thieves in terms of, 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 uh, of uh, the the appreciation and respect for the art. Yeah, he just done Bird, you know. We had the best ever lunch, and I really enjoyed him. And then he sent me this script, which was uh, a film he wanted to do with Charlie Sheen about, um, you know, like novice cops. Can't remember what it was called, The Rookie or something. I don't remember. And he just, you know, 
it wasn't like I'd just come out of school. I just, it wasn't for me, you know. So I politely turned it down. And I remember bumping into him years later at Cannes and he, 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 he cut me dead. You know, he really did. Um, he was not, he was not pleased by that. But anyway, it got me kind of like a foothold. And then I was offered a script, uh, as a, first of all, as a script doctor slash director called The Hot Spot. Uh, eventually Dennis Hopper directed this movie, but I was on board with The Hot Spot. Um, did a really good, I, I think, rewrite and got a fantastic cast. I got um, Sam Shepard, the just emerging Uma Thurman, and Ann Archer were my three three leads, you know, and we were set to go. And then a person who I shall not name um, managed to insult Sam Shepard to such an extent through a contract that Sam uh, basically pulled. Uh, we were in pre-production, he jumped. And then the whole thing very, as you know, very quickly started to fall apart, we tried to get new finance, trying to get it recast, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, and I was suddenly like, still trying to get this film made, um, but realizing that, you know, the boat was kind of not leaving the harbor anytime soon. And then I, Mike Simpson, I got this, uh, the script of internal affairs to me. And I remember reading that and thinking, it's, it's so violent and so kind of like <clears throat> crazy, but there's something really wonderful about the writing, um, Henry Bean, great writer. Uh, and so I came on tentatively on board. Frank Mancuso Jr. Um, liked me, but he, you know, we really had a struggle. I think maybe six months of negotiating with Paramount. They wanted an American director. They wanted Kurt Russell. Uh, they wanted all kinds of stuff that, and I fought my ground and I have to say, you know, supported very well by my producer. Frank, um, who had the advantage of being the son of, you know, another Mancuso who at that time happened to be running Paramount Pictures. So that probably helped, you know. And eventually I got accepted by, you know, the guys at Paramount and, uh, and, we, and we, we went into production, you know, and I'd, I'd met Richard Gere. I really fought the fight because Richard at that point, you know, was also going through, I think, uh, a very, very, very tough patch in his career. You know, he'd done King David. Nobody wanted, he was no longer the A-list guy that he'd been, you know, on American Gigolo and all the other movies and was heavily into the Dalai Lama and, you know, promoting, you know, that kind of philosophy. So, you know, and they, they were really pushing for Kurt Russell, um, you know, I, you know, he's a fine actor, but I didn't, I thought was too on the nose for this. And there was something about Richard that I thought, wow, I think, it, you know, I think he's perfect for this character. You know, he's, he's seductive and uh, the script is very well written, you know. And also I was very naive and, uh, you know, that's it. The arrogance that comes from naivete, you know, was, was I was like, I was in LA and I was thinking, yeah, okay, next, what's next? Okay, I'm gonna make an American film. Why not? It's, and I was just thinking how interesting, you know, it should be like suddenly here and like, you know, in the same way as you look at like the avant-garde theater scene, it's like, look at cinema now, it's like, wow, all new to me. And then the great fortune of meeting John Alonzo, who, uh, who was absolutely the right person to shoot this as well. And um, literally meeting a bunch of, you know, interesting guys and women who, who uh, I was very lucky. They came into my uh, into my uh, headlights, um, and and you know, and with that kind of confidence that comes from not really knowing the scene, oh, <laughs> which I realized, great, great, which great I realized great. to to my cost, you know, like uh, you know, on the next couple of movies because things did not go well after that. But you know, certainly through through the period of um, shooting Internal Affairs, and then once it was released, the reaction was fantastic. You know, I, I suddenly was like you know, uh, people would come up to me in restaurants and I was like, I, they must be making a mistake, you know, like, why is Sean Penn coming over to my table, you know, and uh, why is Mike Ovitz sticking his hand in my face at lunch? And, you know, and it's just like, but you know, that's how Hollywood is. You can suddenly, you can arrive and you can be there and everybody can love you and they can drop you just as quick, you know, 
but when they're in the good time, that's uh, that's quite a buzz, you know. So oh. that's kind of how that that came about, really. Yeah, and it was you know that was a fertile period of time. I mean, I got out of school in 1984, and I remember when actually when Stormy Monday came out, and the films of that era from '84 to to sure. 95 there there was a, it was a beautiful era of of, of films and, yep. and it was uh, it was a time where actually your uh uh old sort of teacher in conflict with you david putnam became what he would become during that period of time right i mean he yeah. uh, uh during the the area the era of chariots of fire and the mission and 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 yeah. ultimately goldcrest films like local hero that were were uh part of that whole series of films that were made up in in, in beautiful films made in scotland gregory's girl yeah. comfort and joy there it was midnight uh, express midnight yeah. express yeah it was you know and 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 your uh fellow uh, uh, directors from the UK were on the rise, right? You had Alan sure. Parker, you had Bill Forsyth in Scotland, right? And, and I mean, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite a an important period, and and David himself also rising up during that period, right? Yeah, but interesting, of course, David then goes to uh, Hollywood, and he becomes um, said he becomes the head of the studio at one point at Columbia, head of a studio for about ten minutes. Yeah, um, that falls out, falls out with my nemesis, Ray Stark. And basically, is is booted out as quickly as he was booted in, you know, um, just because, you know, you he he tried to buck the system, he tried to do it his own way, and you know, the one thing that you do realize if you work in Hollywood is it is a very closely knit community, and it's it decisions are made as it were, in a sort of spiritually organic way. I don't know how spiritual it is, but you know. You know, people have breakfast. It's very important. You know, it's like the way the network works there way before the internet. You know, um, it's like you know you could do a philosophical thesis just on how it works, and it's no different from how the Vatican works or how you know any very evolved, let's say, high finance culture works. Business. You know, it's it's you know. It's not what's going on the surface at all. And if you piss off too many people, and then you basically close all those doors, you cease to be able to function very, very quickly. You know. I mean, yeah. my favorite quote about me uh, came from Jeff Berg, um, who was my agent for quite a while, um, who said to somebody, I think he said to Bill Tennant, the problem with Mike, we love Mike, but the problem with Mike is that he doesn't understand the social system, you know. Uh, and uh, he was absolutely right, you know. Whether it was a willful misunderstanding or whether it was, you know, I mean, my problem is I get too bound up in what I'm doing. So it's like the deal to me is always being of less importance than, than the thing, you know. Whereas Hollywood basically thrives on the deal. And if you're lucky, the product is also can be very good as well. But the product's not the most important thing. The deal is the most important thing. Right, yeah. right, right. Because everybody... Oh, social contract. That's what he said. Jeff said, Mike doesn't understand the social contract. I'm just going to close the door one sec. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But I'm listening. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think everybody is... Uh, is uh, well, I'll let you come, let you come back. I, I, I like the shot of the piano, though. That's very enjoyable. We, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Ha! This is fantastic. Yeah. Love it. Big grand piano in the background. So uh, yeah. And and so now after internal affairs you make a, a, a Liebenstrom, which I've never seen before. I have to see that. How did yeah. that come about and tell me a little bit about the story behind that film? Well, um, when I was doing Stormy Monday, um, uh, Roger Deakins had introduced me to Eric Fellner um, because Eric was producing, I think, uh, a Michael Radford film. Maybe, maybe Eric. Uh, well, he'd done no, Sid and Nancy. Right? And was work and was working title already up and running by then, or not? No, yet? Not no, yet. I don't uh, know. So right. Eric was basically had come out of the um, music video industry very successfully done all, all the videos and produced all the videos for Duran Duran and you know 
he was he was very very successful very good young high energy um he uh, you know he'd used uh, uh michael radford and then and, and then uh, roger roger introduced me to eric i had a meeting with him maybe about maybe i could direct some videos or something but then we got into a a, a, a conversation about feature films and he commissioned Liebestraum, you know so Liebestraum is based on the france list uh you know piano piano virtuoso piece you know literally means love's dream uh, or dream of love um and he uh he commissioned Liebestraum. I, I explained the story he loved it um and so um i started writing over the next year i, I wrote several drafts of Liebestraum. he loved it we were always you know in a, in a good place to make the film in terms of i had a, I had a really you know active high energy producer who was very hip and so on the strength of uh you know internal affairs um everybody liked me they thought of you know i've got very respect respected as a film director suddenly just for my second film and my and so Liebestraum was an, was an american film set in kind of where was it upstate new york um and suddenly a lot of people wanted to be in it madonna wanted to be in it and you know and then uh, Alan Ladd came on with, uh, you know, uh, MGM to uh, to be the production company with Eric and so on. And so, we, you know, we we moved kind of fairly steadily towards this next film because I, I was riding high after after Internal Affairs. They gave me a decent budget uh, and and then I cast Kim Novak, you know, so. Uh, so the cat you know the characters are very simply it's a mother who's in our last she's dying of cancer she's never met her son because he was given away at birth and so the son has she tracks him down and he, they're reunited she's heavily morphined up on because she's dying and when he walks through the door she kind of thinks she she sees him as the absolute double of her late husband who it turns out by the end of the movie that she murdered you know so it's a kind of noir uh and so it's all about you know flashbacks and you know dream states and you know is this real is this not real you know kind of very lynchian you know where i think both david lynch and i were kind of in that same in that same world at that time you know and uh yeah and we went up to binghamton upstate new york to shoot the movie you know uh at which point everything started to go very wrong <laughs> yeah. i mean well you know there was a very difficult production to shoot kim novak uh, bless her was not the easiest person to work with she only speaks badly of me now apparently you know claims that i cut her out of the movie and um you know eric wasn't there a lot of the time i think he had personal issues and you know i was kind of abandoned with uh, this this film production and um a lot of personal issues. It's really a kind of turning point in my life where the transition from being into being a filmmaker, you know, with all of the the good things, but also all of the bad things that come with that. Suddenly, that you're making a lot more money than you ever made in your life before. You have more control in one sense. You have less control in another, and then you're dealing with some pretty pretty tough actors as well, and so. The film remains one of my favorite films and I and I love the film but you know once it was finished and we previewed it it was the most disastrous preview I've ever had in my life literally with people shouting at the screen stabbing the paper where they were supposed to be filling in the questionnaires and um, you know mass walkouts and you know because um, Kim Novak used the c word at one point and it's like every middle aged <laughs> nice lady in the because to be previewed it in new york on a very cold night three days before the first gulf war began so there was like a craziness in the atmosphere and, oh my god yeah and so the film came out very limited release got terrible reviews got very vicious reviews um and uh it's like suddenly i went from that to that you know just like as you do um and that kind of in a way defined that next period because i then went on to a film called mr jones which was even more problematic 
um, a huge fight with uh, the legendary Ray Stark, the legendary producer, um, not, a, not the nicest man on the planet. Um, and I don't think too many people would disagree with that. And, um, and I lost. I mean, I, I, I said, come on, let's go. <laughs> and I, but I knew I was always going to lose those fights, you know. And basically, and then I did the Browning version, which is a beautiful film, but again, got kind of just badly released and, you know, you know, and out of that came, came um, leaving Las Vegas, you know, so. Which, uh, which, which I would, it, of course. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of it, because I always think of these periods as being incredibly useful, interesting times. I'm much more uncomfortable with success, and I'm much more comfortable with it, if, if you like, controlled failure. Now, I got very used to that doing performance art and avant-garde music and stuff where people would shout and throw things and kind of go rubbish and you know you kind of you really have to believe in what you're doing to keep going uh, but you end up with this kind of armor which is like you know you get used to insults and all the rest of it so in that period where things weren't going well in Hollywood I was actually now living in Los Angeles it was like that's when I went to college you know properly film, that's when I went to film school yeah. I started study, studying the films, you know, the, the studio culture, observing how people communicated, uh, really thinking about what do you want? You know, well, you know, how do you measure success? And is it possible in Los Angeles to be within that community and still be in a way and still be creative, you know, with, with all those other things getting in the way? And how do you measure creativity and all of that? So... Well, but there's there's also um, not to not to 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 throw in a, a a a big ball of fire into the middle of the dialogue about Hollywood. The, the reality is they're uh, nervously uh, hoping and engaging in the idea that they can make a bet because every time they're making a bet, they're going to mm. make a bet that you will reach the hearts of the audience through yeah. your work. Also through the marketing as well. Um, and I'm going to give some examples. Um, I mean, I, cause I know a few films where like, I'm going to give an example of a film that I happen to love that was done by, by, by Keanu, which I really enjoy. He directed a film called man of Tai Chi in China. And I don't think anyone in the United States saw the film. And it was, I, th I thought it was, a, 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 I, I love the accomplishment that he made on it. But regardless, um, it was not sold, right? Yeah. And, and then I look at, I look at, at when I worked with, uh, uh, on, on a whole battery of films with Darren Aronofsky, and when he ended up working with Fox Searchlight, the team at Fox Searchlight took his films and lifted them through trailer campaigns and publicity mm. into the yeah. eyes of the mass public. And I'm not saying that they, that any one of those titles that came out went to perform, but I can tell you another distributor might not have garnered the national exposure that he got from that sequence sure. of projects. Cause you got to remember prior to the wrestler, he made the fountain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not many people saw the fountain. This is the real Hollywood, right? So, yeah. So then, then all of us and pie before. So then all of a sudden, it's like he becomes, as we've discussed, the Wonder Boy. But, but the what I love about the the part of the story is it is a collaborative art. There's the filmmaker is is the is the is the is the heartbeat and the pulse and the organism that 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 comes up with the the grand scheme and the idea and the execution, but. You, 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 if it only ends up on a on a on a on a few screens and it's not sold properly, doesn't make it anywhere either, does it? No, I mean you. What you hope for is is a is a combination of you know like a perfect storm in reverse or whatever. Yes. You, you know, you know this happens and this happens and because the fact is it's it's totally a gambling um, you know genre and se and secondly, who knows what the zeitgeist is going to be when the film comes out. You know, right. So, you know, you, you don't have control over those things. So you are, you are, you are hoping for the wind to be in the right direction. Where it goes wrong, 
uh, and this is the big problem with Hollywood. And it's the big problem. And if you read any books about, you know, kind of motivational thinking or success, they'll always say the same thing about corporations, you know. It's the person who can think outside the box is, is going to be the success. Once a corporation is established and it has established its own committees, they inevitably will slow things down. Um, so the committee is, is not a creative thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost an admission of failure. Like you, you, what you don't have one really strong person who can kind of go, yes, that's it. You know, and you look back on the history of the studio system, although they were kind of benevolent despots in many ways, it's, it is full of characters who were like very decisive and made decisions and everybody like then did what they were told. Okay, for better or for worse. But the, the good news was, as a result of that, some amazing stuff comes out because they trust this person. They kind of go, go, with, go with that, you know. My experience in Hollywood has been, you know, uh, that the committee is the worst thing. The worst thing that can happen to a filmmaker, you know. Because they're, you know, they're all absolutely terrified of saying yes to something that's a risk. So, of course, they all care about their jobs and about their their income and so they're all going to kind of going they're going to say no because that's the safe thing because if it's yes and it doesn't work the finger is going to go who who made that decision oh john oh, someone's got to own it yeah and so and that is anti-creativity so the best the best thing you can have with the film is some innovation the idea that somebody can somehow demonstrate their energy through the film and that will connect with an audience then the next bit of luck that you need is that whoever's selling the movie can tap onto that energy and communicate that through a trailer and through a campaign to enough people so that so they get it to go because ultimately that's all it is somebody goes mm, that sounds good that sounds it could be really freaky you know but you know that that yeah, what are we going to do Friday night? I'd like to check that film out. There's something about that actor and the way there was something about the trailer that was really good. So if you get all those ducks lined up, you know, you have a reasonable chance of having a successful movie. But if at the very early stage, some yeah. bunch of dull motherfuckers on a committee have nixed all the original ideas because what they want is a movie that just looks like the other movie that they did last year, you know, which looked like the movie they did the year before that, then you're just making product, you know. And that is the problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was interesting. I did, uh, uh, I did a, a, a fairly substantial uh, uh, episode with the producer uh, of one of the, you know, more voluminous producers in New York, Michael Hausman, who worked with, uh, of course, Milos Forman for all, most of his career, and uh, for all of his career, and and um, and with a lot of other uh, uh, directors over the years, and and one of the things that he talked about was that in the early era of his of 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 his career in the in in the the seventies and and eighties that there was still a, a a culture in Hollywood that enabled the process to be uh, a partly what would be a director's medium right so in other words that that uh, and, 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 and that follows a little bit of light of, about what you've said in, after the success of Stormy Monday about what happened for you. But the idea mm -hmm. is someone would say, yeah, uh, we're going to green light this for a director that we trust. And, and then obviously there's a cast component. Don't get me wrong. There always is a marquee value sure. to you as well. But there's, there's the idea of the, the trusted emissary. I mean, to this to this day, be it with a bonded film that's independently financed and a non-studio film, you're a hell of a lot more likely to find money to make a movie if you're a veteran director with a lesser cast than the other way around. You know, sure. uh, uh, so so uh, uh, a craftsman who is a captain and 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 the and the and the uh, the leader of of the of the ship. Uh, is is more likely to receive the trust now once again everything's turned up on its head over the years in hollywood in terms of the the politics associated with who gets to do what i get that but the the reality is is that in your career you experienced what was once you were a, once you your name got 
into the, 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 the limelight, you were, you were all of a sudden potentially on the list of being a player that could be tapped because you were, you were, you were part of the, the fold. And, 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 your, and your craft and your, the respect for your craft and your leadership as a, as a, a director could, could ignite with a great producer alongside you a film. Yeah. I mean, there are two points that are kind of very interesting. Uh, and one is so obvious, but uh, it's, it's worth uh, reminding everyone. We're so used to the idea of living in the digital age, right? And, you know, like, if you want to send me a film, film clip, so, you know, I'm going Dropbox, yeah, I've got it, you know, it's 4K, blah, blah, blah. Up until, hmm, time code even, you know, 2000, every film that I worked on, once you actually got the green light to go and make the film, you were dealing with mass, and you know this, massive cans of celluloid. Right, negative, uh, answer prints, uh, blah, blah, blah. An editing room was a series of rooms full of bins of masses of cut up pieces of film, cut up pieces of sound, sprocket, and all the rest of it on really variations of the sewing machine, you know, which would be the various editing machines that people were using. Um, so the idea of interfering with a film like that was technically very difficult because once, you know, I mean, you could show people dailies and they could have a comment, but, they, you know, to actually get in and fuck with the edit was very technically complicated. You know, literally would, in, in my case, would be someone basically putting an armed guard on the, on the editing room and, and, and you were banned, as with Ray Stark, you know, where I was banned from my own editing room and he basically bribed the editor to, to screw me and all the rest of it, you know. So, but suddenly at the point where, and I remember, uh, seeing an interview with uh, Bernardo Bertolucci talking about this, because I think Sheltering Sky was one of the first films that was sort of digitally edited. They were using a very early kind of, you know, uh, masses of stacked up machines, basically. Well, the early days of nonlinear were fascinating, and I was very much there for them. It really began in the mid-80s, was when... Yeah. And the companies that, that were the founding fathers before Avid were companies like Montage, Yes, exactly. Razor edit. So, These were yeah. all, and then, and then, in, and then, in the mix, alongside Avid, there was Lightworks, and all of a sudden, yeah. there were these, these, these technologies that were coming about, possessing the opportunity for nonlinear, which really did for film what the word processor did for the writer. Right? We, 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 we yeah. But it also screwed it because yeah. it just meant that you know the legendary Harvey, Harvey Scissorhands and, and his ilk, you know, were able to then, oh, just send over a copy, you know, we've got an avid here, you know, just uh, just give us the data. And, uh, you know, hey, we're all making the same movie. That's like my least favorite uh, expression in, in filmmaking. No, we're not making the same movie. You asked me to direct it and be the author of this film. When you're not making my film, we're not making the same film, not yet, <laughs> you know. Uh, we can agree. We can agree to agree with each other, or whatever. But it's it's not. There aren't three captains of the ship. But from that moment on, it was possible for someone to basically then literally take your film over a weekend, have it completely re-edited, and show a new cut. You know, so that the idea of control of the filmmaker suddenly vanishes in the same way now that the control of the lighting is vanishing from the world of D DPs, because you know. In post-production now, all the grading is done that the DP would normally have done pretty much on the set. And now people are kind of going, no, just give us a flat image and we'll do all the magic later. And DPs are telling me that they're often not even invited into post-production uh, environments and that the, the director doesn't need them anymore because they've got this super whiz kid. You know, so the, the shifting of the power bases has radically changed the result of what films look like in that respect. The second point I wanted to make was I would say the two films that I made within, let's say, the Hollywood system, where I had more control than in any other film, were Internal Affairs, because it was a it was a small project in terms of Paramount, and because of Frank's relationship with with Paramount and his father, they left us alone, and Frank trusted me, and and he just backed me, so we were allowed to do some pretty bold things with the film. 
And then the second one, of course, was uh, Leaving Las Vegas, where I had complete control, although a slightly eccentric uh, producer, um, Lila Cazares, but uh, ultimately they were busy and they didn't interfere. Um, and both those films, in a sense, were the most successful ones I've made within the American system. Um, and the ones that actually got through to an audience in terms of emotional impact more than any of the other films I made. And I would have, I would have thought that would have been some kind of a, a, a demo lesson for a studio saying, you know, Mike's probably better if you leave him alone. You know, he, uh, he doesn't seem to flourish that well under committee supervision, you know. I mean, there's plenty of directors who are committee players, who are team players, who can do that shit, you know, um, as in any industry, and, and God bless them. It's, but it's not the way I work. So, um, but whenever I would have these conversations, I think producers and committees would see these as kind of aberrations, flukes, rather than any kind of demonstration of, of, uh, of a better working system, you know. And that, that kind of, in a way, that, that was a shame because I, you know, I, I do enjoy working within them. I love American filmmaking. I love, as a genre, I think America is a fantastic, uh, the, the, you know, one of the great environments for making films, you know, both in terms of the industry, but also in terms of subject matter. You know, it's like jazz. It's a, it is a kind of an American thing, filmmaking, to a large extent. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and this is a good transition point into another subject that I, I love uh, about your, your, your life, your passion, and your pursuits. There was a, a, an organization, I believe, called Shooting People. People, yeah. Shooting People that you, that you created, correct? Uh, no, I, I godfathered, you know, godfathered. So, uh, okay. yeah. I mentored um, two amazing women who were actually, at the, I mean, ironically, I now teach at the National Film School and I mentor quite a lot of the, you know, every year or so, you know, I, if I must, I, I do mentor students, you know, and two of the students I mentored have now done incredibly well. Um, one of them went on to be a founder of BritDoc, which is an incredibly successful documentary organization, and the other one, uh, Kath, was my my personal camera assistant when I did Hotel in Venice. Um, and she uh, uh, was what the, one of the main founders of Shooting People, which is just kind of like, just a really great website where if you, you want to go and shoot a bit of an indie movie up in Manchester, you need a sound recorder, so you just go on their website and find out who's available, you know. But this was way ahead of the of the curve, you know, when, when she founded this. And so I came on as a kind of godfather uh, and would turn up at the Christmas party and everything and make a speech and do all that stuff. So, I mean, I've mentored quite a few young filmmaker organizations, you know, but it, that's ongoing. Wonderful. And and there there is something that I, I should have known but didn't know. You created something called the Fig Rig. Oh yeah. Um, so when I was, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Well, that came about again just through necessity. So I, after I did time code, the so time code was shot on um, DV cam, but on the DV one fifties, which were kind of you know sort of broadcast uh, size cameras with you know decent size lens on the front and you know. Um, but big, st big, 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 but big. standard, but standard def, correct? Or were they, or were they HD at the time? I can't even remember. No, DV cam was, uh, you standard know, def. that was standard def. Standard def, absolutely. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because I remember, I, not to di not to digress, but Indigent and a few organizations in in the United States when because I did a I did a, an episode with Ellen Curse, she was part of yeah. that movement and shot films like Personal Velocity and stuff like that. Sure. And the, also Doug it, was, it was part of a little oh. mini era uh, and it was uh, it was a moment of uh, of 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 what I like to consider disruption in the industry to say sure, we don't have to capture on film and and I, I I think of you as certainly in the royal family of disruption you're the king yeah. right <laughs> that was the one of the Sony had brought out these cameras um, and they, they did the 150 which was you know and the only reason we used that was just necessity. It was the only camera on the market that would shoot um, a mag uh, you know, a bigger magazine, like 100 minutes, 95 to 100 minutes. 
and time code that had to be one continual take. Um, and they literally were the only camera around that would shoot a 95 minute take. You know, so we had four of those specially rigged up with monitors and all kinds of stuff, you know, to make them. But, uh, um, and that was an amazing experience because I, I, you know, there were four DPs, I was one of them. So to operate handheld for 95 minutes, um, it's just the most wonderful. It felt like uh, running a marathon, you know. I, I remember physically feeling so elated when I was doing that movie because uh, it's such a challenge, you know. And the, the the other DPs were just phenomenal. What they what they you know had to pull your own focus. You had to pull your own aperture. You know you were operating your own zoom. You had an assistant behind you, but basically not not really a camera assistant, almost like a mobile AD. Anyway, as a result of that, I thought I really want to experiment with these cameras because the, the quality for that period was pretty good. Um, and I played with uh, you know video stuff. I'd never been that happy with the, with the visual quality um, until around about this time, mainly Sony was bringing out these very innovative cameras. And they then brought out this thing called the PD-100, which was a, you know, still got mine. It's a, basically a, a hand cam, metal body, very nicely made, uh, satisfying camera to use. You could screw on a wide lens on the front. Lars von Trier had used one, I think, on, um, early dogma movies like uh, celebration Teston. um and so i decided to make another film a much more experimental film called hotel in venice using again four screens or three screens whatever i felt like um so again i had myself and three dps um cast of like 35 actors improvising burt reynolds you know salma hayek and everybody and uh and I started kind of doing tests. And the first thing I realized was that they were so wobbly, you know, that the handheld design on these cameras was not good. You had the strap, you put your hand in. And then I, you know, I remember talking to a, um, a free climber, you know, these guys that climb without ropes and they literally are all on their fingernails. And for some reason, I don't know why I was at some conference and I was on a bus and I was sat next to this free climber. And we were talking about muscles and about the hands and uh, he said, uh, you know, he was talking about strength of the hands. And he said, uh, so how many muscles do you think there are in, in a hand? And I, I went, obviously a trick question. And I went, I don't know, like 50, 60? He went, no. I went, what, more or less? And he went, like this? And the answer was, I think, two. There are two muscles. And one is the thumb, which is the grasping muscle. And I think there's another one between there. But the rest, it's all tendons. It, there isn't room for muscles in the hand. So everything is going into the arm like this. And I suddenly went, ah, oh, that explains something. Because when you're holding a video camera like this, your hand is bent, which means you're pulling on a tendon. And after five or 10 minutes, that tendon's kind of going to go, you know what, I like to straighten out a little bit. So you're going to get a little wobble there. And I thought, that's such a bad design. So I started working with a young designer called Ben Wilson, who had designed a bike for disabled kids using just, you know, body ergonomics. And so we got a whole bunch of pipes and some gaffers tape and some, you know, grips and things and started designing. And I'd come up with the idea of using handlebar of a, of a racing bike and putting the camera in the middle and, and just using that. So I said, the main thing is the hands need to be as far apart for vertical, you know, um, horizontal stability. Which is what and you I, see I, when people hold uh, uh, their rigs like that all over. Yeah. Yeah. So I say I use the analogy of a waiter. Like, so if you have a, uh, a big tray of drinks, you know, uh, the hands need to be far apart and the brain will very quickly work out what is the horizontal, you know, line. So even if you're walking and you're going down steps, the hands will constantly, the arms will compensate. Plus you have an elbow joint, and you have a wrist joint and you have a shoulder joint. So in terms of steady cam design, you have three, six joints combining to take vibration out of, out of movement. So we ended up designing a steering wheel the camera in the middle, the controls like on a racing car where your thumbs are. So uh, I did a prototype and then shot the movie. We made four prototypes 
all the GPs loved them um, because it's just like, wow, this is so stable. And you could run with it. You could hold it like a shopping basket. And you could go really high. Um, the one advantage being that with these new cameras, you could also scribble the, uh, the monitor. So, you know, you could adjust as you went. And then I took it to Manfrotto, the uh, Italian cinema, you know, uh, equipment production company. Um, and uh, so they then licensed it from me. And they, uh, it was about two years ago, they stopped production. And I, since then, I have redesigned it to bring it up to 4K standard. And I'm now working with uh, um, an incredible production company who'd actually do special effects. Neil Corbold, I think you probably know him. Mm -hmm. You know Neil? I don't know his, I don't know him specifically, but I'm sure I know his group perhaps. Yeah, I forgot my name, but uh, everyone's laid off at the moment, but basically they've agreed to work with me. And you know, this now looks like a racing steering wheel where literally all of the controls, focus, everything are just on your thumbs, which are holding, you know, this redesigned fig rig. And, and I've put a 4K camera on there and it all works beautifully, you know. So um, that was just an example of something that came out of like, I have a problem. I don't want to, I don't want to shoot wobbly. Every time I went to see like a dogma movie, I ended up feeling seasick because it was almost like- well, you, you, they you, had... you love the mobile operator uh, capacity, the, the, the movie, yeah. the, the body physically, because when you're, when you're in a handheld scenario, I, I know that it, it would, it's not really a camp thing to say, but it's the truth. The, the, the camera operator is, is a performer. The camera, sure. the camera operator is going through the scene, the camera. I mean, I, I've done some shooting in my life because when I started in production, I, and I shot with the Aton, which I love because it, it, yeah, yeah. The cat position, mm -hmm. the, the shoulder was so big and, and the, and the wood grip and uh, was just a, a lovely camera to work with. And you could, you could move and maintain stability, yeah. but you were the person creating intimacy uh yeah and 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 the and funny enough when i when i was working you know because i've still got my art on you know i would put um long arms on it so actually you know my my arms it's just to to i go back a bit you know um so rather than the camera being like that i would have it sitting on my shoulder but it would also have um extensions out here so i could literally you know control the horizontal a lot better exactly um yeah and um, yeah, I mean, going back to internal affairs, watching and remembering the way John Alonso would do handheld. And I've just read, I'm sure you've, you're aware of that terrific book that just came out now um, about the making of Chinatown. You know, um, I think it's in the New York Times bestseller list. Very, very informative, mainly about, um, you know, Robert Evans and obviously Polanski. And Classic film. Yeah. But there's a whole section on John Alonso, and I said so with great affection, then revisited um, internal affairs. And, you know, I got John. John at that, by the time, did internal affairs. He wasn't operating much. He had an operator, uh, Pernell, who did most of his work for him. But I persuaded him to operate again, and because of his handheld work on Chinatown, and he was a short kind of squat guy. Very well, I, met, I, I actually met John. Years ago, yeah. on, a, on a film, I think it was called House Sitter or whatever. It was a, one of the commercial yeah. films that he did, and uh, and we we would spend time screening in dailies uh, uh, in in the morning and and after wrap. And I got to know yeah. him a bit. What a wonderful man! And uh, wonderful man with his little slim cigarettes that he used to smoke. And very elegant. Um, he liked to play golf, so we used to wrap. <laughs> made sure we wrapped promptly every evening. You know, didn't like to go into overtime. And, you know, as I say, I hadn't operated, but, you know, we got on really well. And I did say, please, can you, you know, can you, can you go handheld? And looking at that footage, man, on internal effect, rock solid. There's no kind of lure, lure, lure. There's no, you know, there's no wobble. So, you know, just because we went to smaller video cameras, there's no reason why it would suddenly become, you know, like seesaw time. So all of that was about, you know, the, for me, the golden rules of cinema, which is like, don't move the camera unless you have to. And if you do it, move it very, very carefully, you know, I mean, really think about the psychology of your camera movement. I say that to young filmmakers, because everybody moves their camera all the time now. And that really has such good stabilization equipment that, you know, they, so it's almost like 
why does the dog lick its balls? And the answer is because it can. It's like with DPs, you know, why do they move the camera? Because they can. And if they're not moving the camera, they feel like they're somehow not delivering, you know. Um, but that's just not true, you know. I mean, it's like creating a frame is in itself an art, you know. And often create the frame and really don't don't move the camera because when you move the camera, the audience you're making the audience aware of the fact that there's a camera. It's like you really don't want to know about a camera, you know. Yeah. It's just a, de a device for recording drama, you know, that's all it is. Well, well, talk that's talk any production yeah. designer, and uh, yeah. and they'll and they'll talk about. Well, uh, I need to make sure I know what's in the frame. You know, yeah. what's in the frame? What's you know? And their their craft is based on 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 working with the cinematographer for what will be in the shot, right? I mean, because because mm. because you're not seeing everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, it's such an important part of the 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 ultimate uh, collaborative and and what you see actually outside the frame is usually quite surprising if you watch production going on so it's uh yeah yeah it's it's, it's quite beautiful to watch um uh, another little uh, thing i didn't realize is you were you're associated with a school in 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 switzerland is that still going on um that's kind of i think they're having uh, like everybody in education, having financial, both financial and also leadership issues. Uh, so this is the uh, EGS European Graduate School. I mean, this is an amazing place. It's a kind of, it's the seat of kind of contemporary philosophy. Um, the guy that used to run it, Wolfgang Schumacher, was just, it's just amazing philosopher, just an amazing person. So he, you know, opened things up by, the, you know, it's a summer school. Um, everybody has an online course and then they come together for a couple of months in the summer in this village in the, up in the Alps in Switzerland. And it's, a, it's a, called a quiet village and there are no motor cars, you're not allowed to make a noise, nothing. Um, and the school is there and he has people like Peter Greenaway and um, Zizak, you know, the, uh, the, the really eccentric uh, philosopher, film critic, um, all kinds of people. Uh, would come and just, they said, you know, so I got invited to come and said, you know, just, just work with the students for a week, do some seminars. So um, I've done it five or six times now. And, you know, I literally, so I turn up, I have maybe 20 young philosophers aged somewhere between usually mid twenties to well into their fifties. Um, and we just begin, you know, I get them to do a bit of acting or, you know, it terrifies them. Um, and then try and, make this bridge between the kind of let's say very heightened elitist world of um abstract thinking philosophy um and and practicality and that's what wolfgang really liked that i did was that because he always said you know philosophy is about the heart it's not about the intellect it's an intellectual device but it is ultimately it has to affect the heart and if it's not affecting the heart it's it's, it's there's no room for it in my world so he liked the idea of, and I would go with Rosie, my partner, who's an amazing musician, and we would always do a concert as a part of our finale, you know, just to sort of like bring in music as well. So, um, yeah, that had, that the last two years, that's been on a kind of hiatus while they sort, the, sort themselves out. I, and I sincerely hope that that will spring back after all of this coronavirus. Um, it's stuff. over, yeah. Um, yeah. Another part of your life that we haven't talked about that I absolutely adore is your commercial advertising and branded content work. I believe you did a whole bunch of work for Agent Provocateur as well yeah. as for the Cosmopolitan Hotel. This is something that as the type of creator that you are, you must have enjoyed tremendously. Um, uh, sure. I, I, would, I would love for you to send me uh, some links uh, uh, to some of the work because I don't always know which ones you made. I guess they're on your website. I'm assuming. Um, well, I do tend to neg I neglect my website quite a lot, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But um, I, I can send you links for sure. I mean, they were great. The agent provocateur ones is literally. Um, I went to them and said, "Let me let me do something for you," you know. So I did a, a short kind of, kind of like a almost like a 50s french blue movie called tied up at the office you know obviously they are high-end you know sexy lingerie companies so um 
So I did a kind of slightly naughty little film. Their website crashed, you know. Um, and so then it, uh, we had another meeting, a cup of coffee, and they said, "What, you know, um, what about doing something with Kate Moss?" And I said, "That would be great." So we ended. I ended up. They had very little budget, um, but I worked with a brilliant designer. We made all the sets out of cardboard. Um, these kind of fake perspective sets and everything. I shot everything on night vision, infrared, um, on a Panasonic. Um, and I made four films with Kate um, in the space of one afternoon. Um, they gave me total freedom. I wrote it, directed it, edited it, did the music. Um, and then at the same time, I shot their photographic campaign for the catalog with Kate. and. Yeah, this became this iconic moment, you know. Uh, they say knickers have never been the same since. You know? yeah. um, literally, I mean, I remember being on a plane and reading um, a big article in the Daily Telegraph by uh, I think Susie Menkes or someone who was just saying that you know ever since that campaign, you know, everybody now needs must have a celebrity selling their stuff. It can't just be a model, so it has to have a kind of personality attached to it and. Um, I mean, the website literally went through the roof, millions and millions of hits, and they sold, they, yeah, they just went through the roof with their profits and everything. And again, it was an example of the frustration sometimes in my life where I say, you know, I always wanted to be able to just go to somewhere like Prada and say, look, just let me, let me do a campaign for you, uh, and I'll give it to you. Give me a budget, and I'll give you a campaign. I don't need a conversation. Just let me do something for you. Let me paint something for you. Um, and I, and I, it'll save you a lot of money because it'll cut out all these other people. Um, I can do it virtually with my own team of three people. Um, just let me do it. But people are very nervous about that. You know? So the few occasions where, uh, you know, the Cosmopolitan, that was a bigger, much bigger budget and everything and went through several agencies. But ultimately the woman, who was running the hotel, she let me just do what I wanted. Well, know, they were so. crazy ads. I mean, I mean, I know you did a bunch of them, but they're wacky ads. Yes, they are, I, yeah. I love them, yeah. I love them. Yeah. I mean, because one, one of their taglines, I mean, unfortunately, uh, and the uh, annual pilgrimage that I make to, uh, to, to Las Vegas for Can A B canceled this year, but uh, uh, there would be the big, the big uh, 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 tableau ads that would just say uh, cosmopolitan a hotel the right amount of wrong, and I was yeah. like, this is this is just. And then when I when you told me that you were doing their ads, I was like, oh my god, this was made yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then I did a, a wonderful campaign for Long Van um, um, in Paris um, with this amazing designer Albert Ibez. You know, um, big budget. You know, um, and they basically allowed me to build a massive corridor of the Georges Saint Hotel in a studio. And, you know, uh, I had an amazing DP. I could do what I wanted. And, you know, that was like a 13-minute ad, a 13-minute special, you know. Um, and it, it's, it's really good. You know, it's really good stuff. And again, he just basically let me run, you know. I was working with an agency. They were a bit kind of like, Oh, and they kept on all these film references and kind of going, I wanted to be like scene and filmic and this and, you know, Kubrick and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> and then we had a meet meeting finally with, uh, with Albert, the designer, who I'd never met before. And we were in the middle of a kind of quite a tense negotiation with the agency, the Swedish agency. And uh, there's this wonderful moment where Albert listened and he said, uh, do you know Mike's work? And, uh, and they went, well, yes. He said, yeah, because I didn't. He said, Albert said, I, I've looked it up and um, he's very specific. So I'm, I'm assuming that you've asked Mike to do this because you really like what he does. Otherwise you would get, you know, um, Ridley Scott or you would get, uh, you know, uh, Peter Lindbergh or some fashion photographer to do this for you. But I'm, I'm assuming you like Mike, right? That's why you've asked him. And they went, well, yes. He said, so why don't we just let him get on with it? You know and do a mic, you know, basically that's what he said. And they went, oh, well, yes, of course. But I mean, I was like, it was almost like I couldn't have paid for 
uh, you know, or even scripted a better response. You know, and that's the only time really it's ever happened <laughs> where someone just said, "Why, why use him if you don't want to use him?" You know, it's like because he's probably not very good at doing a Ridley Scott for you. They probably want to get Ridley for that. You know, so it was just such a common sense thing to say to someone. I just thought, "Wow, it's so obvious." You know, collaboration with the right people and having the right representation. Um, the other part of your life that I love, and you just sent me a clip and I listened to it, man, uh, uh, alone together, that jazz piece. I'd love to, I, if it's okay, I'd, I'd love to, to send that link uh, uh, into, uh, if it, I, don't, sure. I don't know if it's into my podcast uh, and uh, be able to have it on the, the pod matrix. It would be a nice piece of jazz to, to play along. Yeah, by, all, by all means. That would yeah, be yeah, wonderful. Yeah. That would be wonderful, and mm. and and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask to do something that's entirely unconventional right now, and I don't know if you're gonna want to do it, but I'd love you to do it because I love you and I love what we've done today. Would you walk back to that grand piano for me and play something? Sure. Do you want me to? I'll walk, uh, walk the camera and bring, back. and bring the camera back there if you can. Mm. Is that possible? Oh, there it's we go. entirely. Watch this. Uh-huh. Giddy up. Giddy up. Uh-huh. All right, let's frame it a little bit to the left there. there. A little bit to the left if you can. I don't see you. There we go. Bingo. There we go. Yeah. And as it All right. And now it's slowly sinking. Um I'm just gonna secure it. Secure it. Yeah. And I, I, I cannot think of a better way to say thank you. I love you. This is wonderful. Now Mike Figgis is going to play the, the, the title credits at the end of Conversations with Charlie, Mike Figgis on the piano, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so uh, this, would, would you like a blues or you want um, something from a film or? Uh, what, yeah, give me, give, me, uh, give, me, give, me, give me something that you'd love to play, like a, a blues piece or even something from sure. a film. That'd be great, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mike. I love you. This was fantastic, and uh, uh, and, and I, I look forward to the next time. And uh, and stay in touch. Don't be a stranger. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. And good to see you, Charlie. Okay. Good, good Take care, you, friend. Thank you. The Pod Matrix.